All right. So uh, our first talk of the session is Brian O'Gorman uh, from UC Berkeley and telling us about electronic structure and fixed space. Uh, so yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, the computational complexity of the electronic structure problem. Uh, this is joint work with Sandy Arani, James Whitfield, and Bill Pfefferman, uh, all of whom are here. Uh, I should note that uh, this collaboration started uh, last spring at the Simons workshop, uh, so it's especially nice to be here in person presenting the results. Uh, so the main result of this talk is the following, that uh, determining the ground state energy of an electronic structure Hamiltonian in a fixed basis set with fixed particle number and to inverse polynomial precision is QMA complete. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll describe later what exactly the electronic structure problem is, uh, but this is a reasonable formalization of arguably the fundamental computational problem in quantum chemistry. Uh, and then additionally, uh, we show that finding the lowest energy Slater determinant of uh, the same type of Hamiltonian and the same regime is MP complete. Uh, where Slater determinants are a uh, subclass of quantum states that are uh, efficiently describable and usable classically. Uh, so backing up a bit, uh, you know, let's recall local Hamiltonians acting on qubits, uh, the, the things that we're normally used to thinking about in, in quantum Hamiltonian complexity. Uh, you know, they have some uh, locality that is, you know, each term acts on at most uh, some constant number of, of qubits, uh, qubits and non-trivially, there's some local dimension uh, and this is a canonical QMA complete problem, uh, maybe the canonical problem. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons that we care about it is because we think that physical systems are governed by uh, such local Hamiltonians. Um, but really, local Hamilt physical local Hamiltonians uh, often have uh, a lot more restrictions just than locality in this generic sense. Uh, so we can ask, you know, are these more restricted classes of Hamiltonians still hard to find the ground state of? Uh, so one of the first results along these lines was showing that uh, you can introduce uh, spatial locality even in, two in 2D uh, and with qubits uh, on a grid. Uh, this was shown by Oliveira and Terhal. Uh, Gottesman and Rani showed that uh, translationally invariant in Hamiltonians in 1D, uh, where translationally invariant means that the term is exactly the same uh, throughout space and just repeated. Uh, and this is you know, a common feature of a lot of materials and condensed matter physics. Uh, and then more recently, Pittick and Montanero showed that uh, it's still QMA hard, even if all of the terms are identical up to uh, a positive rescaling. Uh, and this is, again, a very common feature of physical Hamiltonians, because it's not just the uh, geometry that, that's constrained by the physics, um, but also the type of the interaction. And the only thing that changes uh, from instance to instance is the magnitude of the interactions. Uh, that, that's captured by this, this positive rescaling. Um, but, you know, unless you think such progress is inevitable, there definitely have cases, uh, for example, with traveling salesmen, where we know that uh, the problem is hard in general, uh, but for realistic instances, namely like Euclidean distances, uh, we can effectively get as good an approximation as we want. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's always, a, it's always an open question whether more restricted classes of Hamiltonians are, are still hard. Uh, so that was local Hamiltonians acting on qubits, uh, but a lot of the physical systems that uh, we're interested in studying uh, consist not of uh, qubits, uh, but of indistinguishable particles. Uh, and this is manifested in a permutational invariance of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so there's a, a single one local term and a single two local term, uh, and it's, it's identically repeated for every uh, qubit and every pair of qubits respectively. Uh, and then in addition to the permutational invariance of the Hamiltonian, we're also interested in uh, only per, uh, permutationally invariant states. Uh, so spe spe uh, specifically, we're interested in symmetric or anti-symmetric uh, states uh, and, and finding the lowest energy states there. Uh, and you know, for the purposes of this talk, you can just take as the definition of bosons and fermions, uh, particles whose states need to be symmetric or anti-symmetric respectively. Um, and so this is, you know, a very restricted type of Hamiltonian, uh, and yet in both cases, you know, there are some results showing that it's still hard. So, so uh, Childs, Gossett, and Webb showed that uh, not only generic bosonic Hamiltonians, but uh, specifically the Bose-Hubbard model, which is, uh, you know, a very simple uh, but commonly used toy model of physics, uh, that that is QMA hard. And then Lou showed that at least generic fermionic Hamiltonians are uh, QMA hard. Uh, but electronic structure uh, is a very particular type of fermionic local Hamiltonian. Uh, 
Uh, and there's a lot of structure in the terms that you know, potentially could be exploited by uh, either a quantum or a classical algorithm. Uh, so the question is, is it still QMA hard? Uh, Schurk and Verstrada gave one positive answer to this question by introducing uh, the site-specific magnetic fields. Uh, and this is you know, not an unreasonable thing to do to model uh, certain condensed matter systems. Uh, but typically in uh, quantum chemistry, we, there is not a, an external magnetic field, let alone one that is uh, finely tuned uh, at different points in space. Uh, and so we gave a positive answer to this question uh, in a different way uh, by restricting the basis. And I'll say exactly what that means. So the you know, model of the world that's relevant for us here is that we're trying to model some molecular system. Uh, you know, molecule consists of some nuclei and some electrons. Uh, and it's just the fact that nuclei are uh, much heavier than electrons. Uh, and so it's a very good approximation, uh, commonly taken, known as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, to treat these nuclei as uh, classical stationary point particles. And then the problem is to solve for the quantum electronic ground state, uh, given the positions of these nuclei. Uh, and then there's some outer loop of uh, optimizing the positions of the nuclei that, that's beyond the scope of this talk. So the real goal here is, you know, given um, a model like this, uh, find the ground state electronic energy. Uh, but the problem is that that's uh, an object that exists in the continu continuum. Uh, it's infinite dimensional. Uh, and so, you know, in practice, if we want to represent the state on a computer, quantum or classical, we need to discretize the problem in some way, uh, which makes the, the practical goal um, finding the, ground, the lowest energy state within a given basis. Um, so this is, you know, formally the electronic structure Hamiltonian, uh, given some single particle basis, um, some set of wave functions that we'll use linear combinations of to represent our states. Uh, the Hamiltonian is completely determined by these uh, orbitals. So there are three terms uh, in the Hamiltonian. The first is the kinetic energy that, that all the particles have. The second is some um, external potential. Um, you know, typically it comes from the nuclei, but there, there are more generic models where you can model different environments. Uh, and then lastly, we have this electron-electron uh, uh, Coulomb interaction uh, that is repulsive because both of the electrons are equally uh, charged. Uh, and it has this one over R scaling, which is, is kind of long range. So, so it's um, local spatially, but not, not exactly. Um, and so, you know, despite the, the electron, Despite the electronic structure Hamiltonian having all this structure, we can still prove it's hard uh, in the following way. Uh, so the starting point will be the hardness of the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model uh, shown by Pittock and Montanaro. Uh, and we'll use that to get hardness of the Hubbard model, uh, the Fermi Hubbard model, uh, using two main ingredients, you know, Jordan Wigner to uh, map between fermions and qubits uh, and perturbation theory to uh, simulate the Heisenberg Hamiltonian in the low energy subspace of the Hubbard model. And then once we have a uh, hardness of the Hubbard model, uh, we can try to uh, construct a set of orbitals such that the electronic structure Hamiltonian uh, basically looks like this Hubbard Hamiltonian, uh, at least approximately. Uh, so this is the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Uh, antiferromagnet uh, antiferromagnetic simply means that all of these coefficients are non-negative. Uh, and we, we call that antiferromagnetic because uh, if we're interested in ground states, this has the tendency to induce particles into anti-alignment. Uh, and one you know, important feature of this Hamiltonian is that it's rotationally invariant. You know, there's this uniform uh, linear combination of, of uh, two qubit polys, and there's no preferred direction. Uh, and this will be you know, useful uh, for our purposes because ultimately we'll be reducing from electronic structure where we encode a qubit in the spin of the electron, uh, but without magnetic fields, uh, there's no preferred direction of the spin. Uh, and through the chain of reductions, that'll indirectly correspond to uh, the absence of a preferred direction in this uh, Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Uh, so we want to use uh, hardness of the Heisenberg model to get hardness of the Hubbard model, uh, which looks like this. Uh, it has a very simple form. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is a Hamiltonian that the physicists believe captures, at least qualitatively, uh, many of the important you know, features and dynamics of real um, periodic systems. There are two parameters. One is the uh, on-site repulsion interaction, U, uh, that prevents uh, or, or penalizes uh, two electrons from being in the same place. 
so, you know, in general, the anti-symmetry of the state means that uh, two electrons can't be in the same state, uh, but because there's additional spin components of the state, uh, they can be if they have opposite sign. And this is, this is what that captures. Uh, and then there's this additional hopping term that allows electrons to move from one place to another. Uh, and viewing this as a computational problem, there's a computational problem for every fixed U and instances, encoder, instances are encoded uh, by these weighted graphs where the, the edge weights give the strength of this, this hopping term. Uh, and like I said, the, the Hubbard model is a, is a Hamiltonian that acts on fermions. The Heisenberg Hamiltonian acts on qubits. Uh, so we need some way of mapping between them. Uh, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, we'll use the jordan Wigner uh, transformation. Uh, so we'll take some you know, elementary fermionic operator on the left uh, and map it to a Pauli operator. Uh, and so for example, here, you know, this AI removes an electron from a particular state, uh, which is uh, essentially what this X minus IY does, right? It's a Pauli lowering operator. Uh, but then additionally, there's this long string of Zs uh, that are needed to keep track of the anti-symmetry of the states, which is encoded in the operators. Uh, and this long string of Zs is dependent on the uh, ordering that we choose. Uh, and you know, in general, when we map a local fermionic Hamiltonian to a qubit Hamiltonian in this way, uh, it'll become non-local. Uh, but in our case, we'll be able to choose a, a very particular ordering such that uh, this basically becomes a non-issue. And at the end of the day, we'll get a local Hamiltonian, uh, specifically the, the Heisenberg model. So the next ingredient is, is perturbation theory. Uh, so we'll choose two parameters of our Hubbard model, a very large onsite uh, penalty, uh, and we'll set the uh, number of electrons equal to the number of spatial orbitals. So the onsite repulsion prevents uh, more than one electron from being in any one place. Uh, and then the, the fact that the number of places are equal to the number of electrons means that the ground state will effectively be in a subspace where there's exactly one electron per uh, spatial orbital. Um, but exactly in that subspace is not, the Hamiltonian is not that interesting. Uh, so we'll do some perturbation theory. Uh, and to second order, we get, uh, we get the Heisenberg Hamiltonian that we want, at least within the low energy spectrum, uh, up to some error. Uh, and note that, um, you know, because we're restricting to this uh, half filling subspace, the long string of Zs just becomes these constants in the, the second to last line, uh, you know, these, these signs that depend on the indexing. Uh, but then because we're going to second order, uh, they all cancel out. And so the uh, general problem of non-locality from Jordan Wigner is, is a non-issue here, uh, but by carefully choosing the uh, orbital indexing. Um, so to recap, you know, we started with the Heisenberg instance and we constructed a Hubbard instance uh, that encodes the Heisenberg instance in its low energy subspace uh, by choosing a very large onsite uh, repulsion term and, and setting uh, the number of electrons to the number of spatial orbitals. And then through a combination of uh, jordan Wigner and perturbation theory, uh, we can simulate the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, thereby showing hardness of the Heisenberg, uh, so, sorry, showing hardness of the Hubbard model, uh, which we can now use to um, show hardness of the electronic structure problem. Uh, so the input is you know, a Hubbard model that we want to simulate using uh, electronic structure. Uh, so we have this onsite repulsion and this uh, you know, weighted graph giving the, the hopping terms. And what we want to do is construct a set of orbitals such that the electronic structure Hamiltonian basically looks like a Hubbard model. Uh, and we'll do this, do that through a construction which uh, constructs a bunch of primitive orbitals that will just be you know, standard Gaussians in space. Uh, and then we'll take linear combinations of these primitive Gaussians uh, and form what I'll call composite orbitals. And it's these composite orbitals uh, that will be the orbitals of the electronic structure Hamiltonian. So, you know, for example, if we had a Hubbard model uh, represented by this graph on the left, uh, you know, this graph is planar, uh, you know, for visual clarity, in general, the uh, Hubbard model instances that we get from the hardness proofs are in general non-planar. Uh, and, and as far as we know, can't be made to be planar. Uh, but anyway, so we have this input graph uh, and what we'll do is we'll introduce a primitive orbital for every vertex and a pair of primitive orbitals for every edge um, in this way where I've elided the, the vertex orbitals um, for, for visual clarity. And then what we'll do is, you know, we'll take uh, the primitive orbitals near each vertex and combine them into a composite orbital for, for inputting into the electronic structure Hamilton. So for example, you know, these three highlighted uh, primitive orbitals will go towards uh, 
the composite orbital corresponding to the vertex between them, uh, these three will go for that vertex. And note that if we consider two vertices, there's exactly one pair of primitive orbitals that are very close to each other uh, that we'll use to engineer the interaction between these vertices. Any other fermionic fermion qubit mappings other than the Jordan Whitner? Uh, no, um, because like in general, different fermionic qubit mappings have you know, advantages and disadvantages. Um, but uh, Jordan Wigner worked for our purposes, so so um, there wasn't any need to consider other ones. Um, I mean, I think. Uh, in the early days, that was that was a big open question. I think we did consider um, ones, but you know, eventually um, realized that Jordan Wigner, which in many senses is the simplest one, uh, was good enough. That that the general problem, the general disadvantage of Jordan Wigner, which is this non-locality, uh, basically magically goes away. Uh, I mean, maybe not magically, but uh, fortuitously, it was not uh, designed that way. Yeah. Um, so if we construct the orbitals in this way. Uh, I should know that I can't see the questions at all. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so if we design the orbitals in this way, we, we have some set of parameters uh, that describe them specifically. Uh, the first two are the exponents of these Gaussians. Uh, we'll use one, or one exponent for the primitive vertex Gaussians and another exponent for the primitive edge Gaussians. Uh, and we'll set the, um, this vertex Gaussian exponent beta to be very large, which will engineer uh, a very large on-site repulsion interaction. Uh, and then we also have uh, you know, the distances between all of these pairs of points, uh, in addition to some lower bound big gamma on what we mean by far away. Uh, so we'll have these pairs of points that are very close together and everything else will be very far away. So to make it negligible. Uh, and now we have these orbitals and we wanna carve out a Hubbard model. model. So the first problem is that uh, we have these linear combination of Gaussians, so they're not perfectly orthogonal. Uh, and for most of them, the, the overlap is negligible. Uh, they're, they're far apart away. Uh, but we have these pairs of points that are very close together that uh, we want to engineer interactions between, and the overlap is not negligible. Uh, but there is a you know, quantitative way of accounting for that. Uh, so that, that's the first step. Then we remove the interactions due to things that are far apart. Um, and this is the one you know, approximation we make that's sort of independent. We can set gamma, big gamma as, as large as we need to. And if we do that, uh, we get to a Hamiltonian that at least starts to uh, represent the, the graphical structure of the Hubbard model that we want to simulate. Um, but still there are some uh, undesirable terms in this Hamiltonian uh, that we will neglect by setting the parameters in a very specific way. Uh, and if we do all of this, then we get to uh, essentially a Hubbard model approximately. And uh, you know, most, much of the work, the technical work of the proof is showing that the error of this approximation is small enough. So that was uh, QMA hardness of finding the lowest energy quantum ground state. Uh, now let's talk about finding the lowest energy Slater determinant. Uh, so for QDIT local Hamiltonians, uh, we can consider the lowest energy product state. Um, sometimes this will be a good approximation to the true ground state. Uh, sometimes, you know, in general, it won't be, or at least we don't expect it to be. Uh, but in any case, it's a well-defined uh, computational problem, uh, and in particular, it has a classical witness that, you know, that we can classically describe the, the product state. Uh, and so for fermionic systems, the uh, analog is Slater determinants, which are really just anti-symmetrized product states. Uh, and a, a common computational problem in, in quantum chemistry is finding the lowest energy Slater determinant, which is known as the, the Hartree-Fock problem or the Hartree-Fock state, uh, the, the outcome of this. Uh, and, and again, many cases, this is a good approximation to the ground state. Uh, but even when it's not, this uh, Hartree-Fock state is usually a good starting point for, for more advanced uh, computational methods. Uh, and so proving MP hardness of finding the lowest energy Slater determinant proceeds largely along the same lines. We use the exact same orbital construction, uh, but we use uh, we choose a slightly different or maybe qualitatively different parameter regime. Uh, specifically, we set all the exponents of the Gaussians very large uh, so that we effectively get these classical point particles uh, resulting in uh, a diagonal classical Hamiltonian. Um, and we have this, you know, again, an on-site repulsion term that will set very large. 
uh, which means that the ground state will be in a subspace where there's no more than one electron in each uh, spatial orbital. And once we've done that, we, we get this very simple Hamiltonian, uh, which we can essentially use to compute independent set. Uh, so if we make this analogy uh, between you know, spatial orbitals and vertices, uh, whether or not an electron is in a particular spatial orbital uh, with whether or not it's in a particular set uh, and the energy with a number of bad, edge, bad edges, uh, if someone gives us a, a graph and asks us, is there an independent set of, of size K, uh, we can construct these orbitals such that um, the, electronic, the ground state energy of the electronic structure uh, Hamiltonian with K electrons will be zero if and only if uh, there's an independent set of that size. So going forward, uh, you know, one of the motivations for this work uh, is the widely held belief that uh, you know, quantum computers will be useful for solving uh, electronic structure Hamiltonians. Um, but we know that you know, even quantum computers have their limits. Uh, there needs to be some upper bound on what they can do. Uh, we know they can't just solve any local Hamiltonian problem. And so the, you know, the question, one of the questions that we're trying to answer is, um, you know, where, where is this upper bound on what, what quantum computers can do, specifically in the context of uh, quantum chemistry? Uh, and so our work you know, uh, qualitatively improves this upper bound. You know, we know that not just our generic fermionic local Hamiltonians, QMA hard, but specifically ones with uh, the structure uh, where the coefficients are those of electronic structure. Uh, but still there are uh, you know, many unrealistic aspects of the orbitals that we construct. Um, so in particular, you know, chemists are, you know, in practice, solve the problem in a fixed basis, but they try to do so in a good basis, a basis that um, they hope captures the actual ground state. Uh, and so I think, you know, further improvements in this work will use, uh, show hardness for electronic structure Hamiltonians with better and better um, orbitals. And also, you know, one thing I sort of um, hit, on the, hit under the rug is that we set the external potential to be zero here. Um, whereas in reality, you know, there's these uh, nuclear potentials, which are exactly what keep the electrons, you know, around them in space. Uh, and so we have these, uh, you know, two directions of attacking this problem, you know, upper bounds coming from complexity theory uh, and, you know, lower bounds coming from, uh, you know, algorithm development. And we know there needs to be, you know, some transition from, from hardness to easiness, either using classical or quantum computers. Uh, and, you know, it's a very big open question, you know, where this transition is, you know, what is the special property that we expect certain realistic chemistry instances to have that uh, would allow them to be solvable efficiently by a quantum computer. Um, we know it's not just that they're electronic structure Hamiltonians, but is there some other property that we can identify that uh, would escape these, these worst case hardness results? And uh, that, that's a big open question that, that I think that there's a lot more work to do to, to narrow down. Um, and then more generally, you know, I, I focus specifically on the ground state energy problem, uh, but there are a lot of other computational problems in quantum chemistry. Uh, so a common priv primitive in quantum chemistry calculations is uh, calculating the overlaps between two different quantum states. Um, we're also interested in the, the spectral gap, which is important for dynamics, um, other properties of the ground state besides just the energy, like correlation functions and things like that. Uh, and I, I think that all of these are pretty well studied in the context of local QDIT Hamiltonians. Uh, but again, you know, the, the Hamiltonians and the instances of these problems that, that arise in quantum chemistry have a lot of structure. Um, and you know, I, it's a big open question whether uh, they're still hard even with all of this structure, or there's something about that structure that can be exploited to get efficient classical or quantum algorithms. Um, that's it. Um, you said this, you described this construction as an approximate covered model, and then you said you know, to make it exact, you have to follow through some, uh, you have to be careful about the approximation. Can you, is there any sort of, without getting into the details, any summary as to what the techniques are for, for what, what, what that looks like? Um, yeah. Um, so, um, I 
I mean, so it's, uh, you know, basically for every approximation that we, that we make. Um, so, okay, so the first step, um, you know, when we orthonormalize, it changes what the Hamiltonian is, um, but like, we get a specific expression for, for what that is. Um, for all the other things, we're basically just throwing away terms. Uh, and so basically the techniques are like, you know, calculating exactly an upper bound on the magnitude of the things that we're throwing away. Um, and at the end of the day, we get a bunch of constraints. You know, we want all of these things to be in aggregate um, smaller than the precision to which we're trying to estimate the ground state energy. Uh, and then it's just a matter of setting the parameters so that all of these constraints are satisfied. And is it delicate enough that these constraints are independent or something like that? Yeah, so that was, um, they are, so the, there's one constraint that is independent, um, you know, this lower bound on what we mean by far away. Um, we can basically set it as large as we need to, um, but all of the others are competing. Uh, and so it is, um, you know, relatively, it's non-trivial to find the parameters. That was, um, you know, one point we, we had these constraints and uh, it was difficult to show that they were satisfiable. Um, and at one point we needed to, um, tighten up the constraints, or actually loosen up the constraints, you know, tighten up the analysis so the constraints weren't as strong as they originally were so that they could be um, mutually satisfiable. All right, we have a question in the Q&A from Juan Lu. The cusp condition of electronic structure wave function will not be exactly guaranteed by using a linear combination of a finite number of Gaussians. Is the deviation from the exact, exact cusp condition properly bounded in the proof? Can you say more about that? Um, so that is, uh, you know, when I said that these orbitals are bad orbitals, uh, that, that's exactly what I meant. Um, and, you know, in particular, the cusp, you know, the cusp arises from uh, having a nuclear potential, uh, like an external potential that is these point, positively charged point particles. Uh, but here, the external potential is zero. Um, there's no cusp because there's no potential. Um, and, you know, that's what's unphysical about this choice of orbitals. Like we're, we're solving the problem in this uh, in a particular, particular single particle orbital basis, uh, but there's no physical reason to do that. Um, it's very much just matching the syntax of the, the computational problem without matching really the physics of it. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, the, the next step in, in this line of work is, is trying to improve that. Uh, and that would, um, yeah, that, that would include having, uh, you know, a point, a nuclear potential that would induce these cups and, and we would need to use much more complicated orbitals. Um, and I mean, I, I think it's not quite right that there's not a, um, a finite number wouldn't suffice, um, but it's certainly not a constant number. I mean, it, it would need to be a very large number of, orbitals um, to capture, at least approximately, the cost. I have a question, actually. On your last slide, at one end of the spectrum was electronic structure instance of the BQP. What do we know about that space? Can you say more? Um, I think, you know, not much. Um, I mean, there's not much we can say along those lines as far as I'm aware of in terms of the, directly in terms of properties of the Hamiltonian. Um, so there are, uh, you know, there's a lot of great algorithmic work for doing time evolution. Uh, and so one thing we could say is that, um, you know, we can solve Hamiltonians for which we can do time evolution and for which the adiabatic algorithm works you know, in, in a polynomial amount of time. Um, but I, I don't know of any work that, that translates that back into like a property of the Hamiltonian. Um, it, it's sort of like an operational uh, characterization of what we can do. All right, and a follow-up from one of those. Uh, what uh, is the implication of this result is there's a fermionic quantum there's a fermionic quantum simulator. Uh, you mean a classical one? I um, assume for dynamics. But... Oh, um, 
Yeah, so if you mean that there's uh, a way to simulate fermionic dynamics, either classically or quantumly, pro probably quantumly, um, then yeah, basically exactly what I said, um, that you know, if we can do time dynamics, we can um, do adiabatic evolution for you know, at least polynomial amounts of time. And then uh, the implication is, I mean, just like in general adiabatic quantum computing, the implication is that there are some electronic structure Hamiltonians for which uh, the gap gets exponentially small. Um, but it doesn't say anything about, you know, how to find those instances, how to characterize them, other than th they must exist um, if uh, you know, our, our beliefs about the, the computational landscape are, are true. Will we convene at twelve thirty?